Bueno, pues os ha lanzado el testigo. Eh, ¿Alguien de vosotros quiere empezar a hacer preguntas? Bueno, well, I will no one begins. Eh, just a question. Do you think a person needs to be intellectually prepared to be a believer, to be religious? Because I, I think I, I read something about you that you said that you also discovered that uh, theology had a very big intellectual corpus that uh, was like dismissed uh, by, by, by science or by scientific people. And then when I read that, I, I, I thought to myself, maybe uh, non-believers are just not intellectually prepared to believe. Yes, I, I think that is a very interesting question. I think that um, it's always dangerous simply to draw on your own experience. But I, I'm doing that now, um, and, and uh, others may, may have a different experience. But certainly my view was that as a teenager, I was not intellectually receptive to, for example, theology, because how could it say anything that was interesting or right? It was not as if I'd considered this and rejected it. It was simply I, I could not see why it had anything to say at all. If we needed to be told anything, science could do it. If there was a meaningful question, science could resolve it. And there was, there was no need to involve anyone else in that discussion. And in my earlier talk, I used the word complexification a lot. And I think what I could say is this, is it's when you realize that things are more complicated, then you begin to realize you may have, you may have closed down discussions that needed to be opened up. And so I began to think, look, maybe I have prematurely shut down reflection on something where I need to reactivate that altogether. And so if you like, um, this whole process of reflection made me much more intellectually curious. I was going to discover what these things were all about. And then, of course, discovering that they were really interesting became a motivation for, this, for exploring them even further. So that, that, to me, was very important. But what... Um, What catalyzed me to want to begin that journey of intellectual discovery was actually something else. It was, it was a realization that I had misread things. I had, uh, I had simplified things, and therefore suddenly I felt I had almost like a moral obligation to think about things in much more detail. So you need an, an intellectual maturity. Let's, let's talk about, let's, let's yes, say, yes. I, I, to, I be think to be mature, probably, intellectually, in order to approach these big questions? I think you have to be intellectually open. Okay. Uh, and maturity comes through being open and using that. Okay. But, um, but I think it was... In fact, put it like this. I mean, I, I began when I was 16. Um, I'm an atheist. I know there is no God. The, these people believe there is a God, and that's belief. I know things. Hmm. Beginning to realize it wasn't that simple. Um, atheist people who believe there is no God... Uh, Christians believe there is a God. So actually they are both belief systems. Mm -hmm. And the minute, the minute you see that, because for me, one of the reasons for rejecting any kind of religious belief was this is intellectually inferior. It's a belief system, not something that can be shown to be right. And suddenly realizing actually my own beliefs were beliefs that things I couldn't prove were right was actually really quite disturbing. And, and, and so it did open up this question of whether... It was no longer a question of fact versus faith, but actually was which belief system is most satisfactory and gives the best account of the evidence. And so I saw things in a new way as a result of that line of thinking. Excuse me, before we continue, as you see the food has been served, um, we're going to have the conversation while we eat, so perhaps Father can say a prayer and then we can just have dinner. Or en español, me imagino. Bendícenos, Señor. Bendice estos alimentos que vamos a tomar. Bendice este encuentro por nosotros, por nuestros alumnos. En el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Amén. Amén. Sí, espera. Max, José María tiene una pregunta. We just continue now. I got a question. I'm 
I'm teaching, among other things, I'm teaching literature and, and great books. And it's true that maybe the intellectual maturity they still do not have, especially in the first year. But they are quite uh, emotional or quite uh, sensitive, and they like to look at the, at the beauty. And uh, could you tell us how to how to manage, how to be with our students following the path from the beauty, from things that they can contemplate, and they can get emotional about that, to the sense, to the meaning of Yes, the, uh, I will talk path. about that. Um, let me just take this jacket off, it's getting hot. Um, I think, no, don't worry. I think, um, for that question, I'll stand up so I can talk to you better. Um, beauty really matters. And the way I think of Christianity, or the way I've come to think about Christianity over the years, is we can think of it in terms of this platonic triad. Truth, beauty, goodness. And actually engages all of those areas very effectively. Um, and, and science isn't quite able to do justice to beauty, I think. It, it, you know, very often, um, you may like, be like Dirac, who talks about the beauty of a theory being an indicator of its truth. But actually, for most people, there's this deep sense that beauty really matters. Mm -hmm. If you like, it's a gateway experience, but they're not quite sure what it's a gateway to, or, or how to hold this. The, very often, people have an experience, something very, very beautiful, and want to preserve that experience. And actually, it's very, very difficult to do that. So here's what I would say. Um, what, um, suppose I go out at night and I, I, I see a beautiful tree. I look at that and I will, first of all, appreciate its beauty. And this theological line of thought will go through my mind. That by seeing our world within a theological framework, I'm not simply saying the creation is beautiful. I am saying that and I'm affirming its beauty. But I'm also saying that that beauty points to something else. That there is, if you like, a semiotic aspect to nature. Now, I wouldn't use that to students, you know, that, that's, that, that's to you, okay? But um, in other words, that, that, that nature is pointing beyond itself. And without losing sight of the beauty that's intrinsic to nature, you can in effect say that is pointing on to the greater beauty of God. And therefore, it enables you to really appreciate and safeguard that beauty of nature. But it also helps you to appreciate that actually nature might be pointing beyond itself. And that it gives you an intimation, a hint, that there is something still more beautiful to be discovered. And that, therefore, I talked about a journey of intellectual discovery earlier. I mean, it's not simply an intellectual journey we're talking about. It's a, it's a journey in which we become much more attentive to the beauty of our world, to the importance of respecting that beauty and safeguarding that beauty. And so what I'd want to say to your students is um, value those moments where you sense the beauty of things and realize that actually they're good in themselves, but they're also very beautiful signposts to something still more beautiful. That's how I begin to answer your question. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Um, and I find the idea in the Old Testament. I think of Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And, and it's almost as if that it's saying that your knowledge of, your appreciation of God is enhanced by looking at the beauty and complexity of nature. And certainly, as you probably know, it is thought that that kind of reasoning may be part of the background to the emergence of the natural sciences in Western Europe. You know, this feeling that um, in doing science, 
we are appreciating the complexity and the beauty and the, the, the rationality of the created world. And that actually deepens our vision of God. So in effect, um, it's almost as if there's a kind of natural theology there, in which you're thinking about how um, the beauty of nature can be brought together to understanding of God. And certainly, in the Protestant tradition, there's this long um, history of talking about God's two books, the book of nature, the book of scripture. They're both there, and the wise person doesn't just read them both. Kind of where you read them, and then you connect them up. And so it's that process of interconnection, which is intellectually engaging, but also, I think, provides some very interesting outcomes as well. Y eso, eso me, me permite añadir este pequeño comentario. Para todos, quien quiera a preguntar en inglés, perfecto. Si quieren preguntar en español, perfecto. Sobre todo si os sentís un poco limitados diciéndolo en inglés, si alguno se anima a hablarlo y a decirlo en inglés, pero que si lo dijera en español lo diría mejor y más profundamente, pues mejor en español. Y luego yo lo traduzco. Y él, igual ya hablamos nosotros esto antes, si, él, si la pregunta es mucho más complicada de lo que él intenta hablar, en inglés que se entienda de todos, pero si, si es necesario profundizar el inglés para que la pregunta que hacéis sea mejor respondida, pues igual nosotros traducimos al español si es necesario. O sea que sin ninguna timidez de habla es lo que, en el idioma que uno quiera. Muchas gracias. Ah, se ha referido usted con la palabra sí. Wanda eh, admiración al inicio. Al inicio de toda la actividad cognitiva humana, que inicialmente indaga qué son las cosas y en ellas advierte una, una cierta profundidad. Una cierta profundidad que en principio puede ser descubierta por la razón según sus hábitos propios de, de inquisición y de búsqueda de la verdad. Pero que en un cierto momento advierte. Justamente por esta profundidad de la realidad, su incapacidad para conseguir más adelante. Es aquí donde de ordinario eh, la buena y clásica filosofía, no porque la moderna no lo sea, sino que de, de alguna manera ha sido ideológicamente rechazada, llama en causa a la propia fe. Es, es un argumento aproximadamente, eh, o de algún modo, consistente hasta el siglo XVIII, que eh, la fe viene en ayuda de la razón, es una luz corta, es una luz corta. Hay, un, hay algún autor británico cuyo nombre no recuerdo que precisamente entiende la luz de la razón como un candil en un bosque de noche, de candle of the road, la llama. Y no tiene la capacidad expansiva y explicativa de una luz superior. En consecuencia, mi pregunta está, mi pregunta está en lo siguiente. ¿No hay una cierta, una cierta pérdida del sentido de la profundidad de la realidad? que de alguna manera ha sido, ha sido promovida o facilitada por un análisis puramente experimental de la realidad. Thank you. Um, I think this experience of wonder is very important for classical philosophy. And if we think of Aristotle, for Aristotle, the sciences begin with wonder. And wonder motivates you to want to investigate and hence to explain. Uh, I, I think that's still very important. You know, this, the, the, very often it's a sense of wonder. I certainly remember as a child um, seeing a night sky and feeling overwhelmed by this and wanting to study it because of this experience I'd had. So I think that is very important. And your question is very interesting because it raises this question of what happens if we lose that sense of wonder. In other words, if we, if we are able to represent the natural world very well conceptually or rationally, and do it so effectively that it ceases to be significant. It's a bit like um, Max Weber's um, process of um, entzauberung, you know, um, disenchantment in English, you know, where in effect the universe ceases to be special. It becomes 
rational, it becomes something you can quantify, it becomes something you can manage. And to me, that, that's, that's a really interesting thing indeed. And I, I, I think you've raised a very important point, because the real concern that um, I hear you raising, which is one that I share, and it's this, that if you are a natural scientist, very often you may begin your career with a sense of wonder, and then through over-familiarization with your subject field, that sense of wonder disappears. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, it, what initially motivated you to become a scientist ceases to be part of your professional activity. And I, I think that's a real concern. Um, and um, I think, um, I, I think the, one of the issues here is about how we recover that sense of wonder. And um, I think of a number of writers who are very concerned about this. In England, we had Iris Murdoch, who developed the idea of attentiveness. I'll talk about that in a moment. But in, in French, we have um, Simon Weil, who talks about attente. And again, it's the same basic idea is you have got to learn to refocus on the natural world or whatever it is that you're concerned about and rediscover its depth. How do you do that? Well, they give us some hints, but I think all of us have to find our own way of doing this. But the, the problem is real. And I, I find it, for example, in a, in a work of literature, which um, I don't know if you read here in Spain. In German, the title is Das Heidi. It's about a little Swiss girl, you know, Heidi, mm -hmm. who um, goes to visit her grandfather in the Alps. Uh, and, um, and she's never been to the Alps before. And she's so she climbs up the Alps with Peter the goat herd. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, one, one evening, um, th there's this atmospheric phenomenon by which the mountains seem to catch fire. It's all to do, it's Alpenglue, it's a kind of, it's a refraction effect. But Heidi is astonished by this. You know, it's, what's happening? And Peter says, well, it always does that. <laughs> That's right. As far in the so it's always just that, and you know, has no sense that it's wonderful, you know, and, and that to me is a real issue. What happens if we lose that sense of wonder, and where in effect the scientific enterprise thus becomes simply advancement in understanding without this deeper level of engagement? I think that's a really interesting question, uh, and for me, um, I still every now and then experience a sense of astonishment at the beauty or the majesty of nature. And actually, it, it's never the same as it was when I was much, much younger, but it's almost as like it rekindles memories of the way I used to feel. And that, that, that's better than nothing. But it's something I, I can never quite recapture in all its fullness, which I, I'm sad, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I mean, I, I agree. Um, if we look at early English scientists, for example, in the late 17th, early 18th century, they were talking about Newton, uh, Hooke, Boyle. Um, <coughs> they used the phrase natural philosophy to describe what they were doing. And it's very interesting because they saw natural philosophy as having two functions. And you've identified them very well. Number one, to understand nature better. Number two, to understand ourselves better and become better people. And there's this very strong sense we are part of of this complex universe. And by understanding it, we understand ourselves and so become better people. Now, we've lost that sense of nature educating us, I think. 
But for, for those people you're talking about, you're absolutely right. They saw themselves as priests in the temple of nature, who in effect were in the presence of something greater, which could help them become better people. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, in, um, you said earlier, before we came, that you had engaged in a debate with uh, um, Richard Dawkins at some point. Did you ever, in your engagement with him, even either publicly or privately, do you ever, especially privately, did you ever have a sense that these arguments were making some impact on him? Or was he politically committed from the start and to the end? Um, I, I have debated with Richard Dawkins in public, but I also had uh, an hour-long private conversation with him, which I promised I would keep private. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I, I mustn't um, disclose anything. But I will, um, I will comment on the question you're asking. Um, when your intellectual case is weak, you have to supplement your argument rhetorically. And the greater the rhetorical supplementation, the weaker the evidential foundation is likely to be. In my discussions with Richard Dawkins, I found that there were questions I was asking privately, which he found very threatening. In other words, and, and he would not answer them. And what he would do is he would redirect my question, rephrasing it as something which he felt very comfortable with, and then answer that question. But it was clear there were certain areas where he did not wish to be pressed. Uh, and um, I found that really quite interesting because it seemed to me that, that perhaps he was beginning to realize, as a result of the debates he had s engendered, that things were not as simple as he had thought, and he was finding this uncomfortable. Now, there was a very interesting debate in Oxford in 2000 and. Twelve, I think, between Richard Dawkins and Rowan Williams, who was then Archbishop of Canterbury. That, that debate is available online. Mm -hmm. And at one point, Richard Dawkins does experience some difficulty. And it's over this question, which is really quite a problem for the movement called the New Atheism. And, and the, the issue really is they use standards of evidence to judge other people that they don't apply to their own beliefs. And so, in effect, Dawkins was pressed on whether he could actually prove his own beliefs. And, I mean, he, and he knew he couldn't. I mean, that, that, that's his problem. The, 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 the thing that haunts Richard Dawkins is, is the knowledge. He, he, he demands other prove, to prove their beliefs, but he cannot prove his own. That's the real dilemma. And this was very publicly exposed. And Richard Dawkins, in effect, said... I'm a kind of agnostic. Now, in the context, you can see exactly what he meant. In fact, you know, he, said, he said, look, I, I just can't prove this. And in one sense, I'm agnostic. But the problem is that the, it wasn't just that it was Rowan Williams and it was Richard Dawkins discussing. It was one of England's most senior philosophers chairing the debate. And that was Sir Anthony Kenny. And he pounced. He said, look, you, you are the, the world's most famous atheist, and you're saying you, you're an agnostic, you can't actually prove this stuff. And Dawkins found that really very difficult. But I, I would just say it illustrates the point I make in this book, and the point is very simply that actually all of us, atheists and Christians and everyone, hold beliefs we can't prove to be right. So we, we have to get used to this. But it, it is epistemically just and fair to judge yourselves by the same criteria you use to judge others. And thus, I, I don't really see Richard Dawkins doing that. So that, that would be my concern, that he is aware that in, in his rhetorical flourishes, he will be very critical of the rationality of other people's beliefs, but will not apply those same criteria to his own beliefs. That's a real problem for him. So actually, he tries to avoid that issue. Uh, in public discussion. Mm -hmm. And in that televised discussion, he couldn't avoid it. It was forced on him. I, th I think you've, you've mentioned the point several times. <clears throat> we are talking about atheism as a, as a faith. Mm 
or, or as an ideology. And we have the faith in God, the faith in the, non, in the non-existence of God, and then there is this intermediate point, you, you call it agnostic, which is, I assume that I must live with many uncertainties. One of those uncertainties is the existence of God. So, I'm going to live with, I assume I'm going to live with this doubt all my life. And maybe that's agnosticism. Agnosticism is not saying God does not exist. It's just saying, I don't know if it exists or not. No, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Do you remember I mentioned Bertrand Russell yeah. earlier? Yeah. Bertrand Russell um, understood your question precisely. And, and here is what Bertrand Russell said. Epistemologically, Russell was an agnostic. Mm-hmm. He said, look, using the resources of human reason, mm-hmm. I cannot tell you whether there is a God or there is not a God. And therefore, epistemologically, I cannot resolve that issue. Mm-hmm. But then he said something else. I have made the decision that I'm going to live my life as an atheist. In other words, he, he, he was... You see, see the distinction? Yeah, but that's, a, that's like saying, I've made the decision of supporting uh, Real Madrid. Yes. Okay, that's a personal, a personal decision. So that's, that's fair. But there, there is another way of, of looking mm-hmm. at life. It's saying, I, I will take the decision, I will assume the decision that I will live all my mm. life with that uncertainty. Which he did not take. That's it. He, in effect, said, epistemologically, I am left in an uncomfortable place. Okay. That, in effect, it prevents me from um, having certain political beliefs and doing certain <clears throat> things, and I believe these need to be done but I can't justify these beliefs. But I nevertheless feel that they are right, can't Mm -hmm. prove it, but I feel they're right, Mm -hmm. and therefore I want to commit myself to them. How can I commit themselves to them that can't prove them to be right? Well, the answer is I make an act of volition. I choose to do this, recognizing I can't prove it, but feeling that the evidence is going my way. Mm -hmm. But the point, the reason I'm mentioning him is just that he illustrates very well the point that you're making which is that to live a meaningful life, very often we have to go beyond the available evidence in making political or social. <coughs> and, and I'm just saying, let's be honest about this. Yeah. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. I mean, I, I know why I believe in God. I can't prove it, but there are good reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I've sorted that out to, my, to myself. But the point I'm trying to, to, to make in this book is actually, I think there are some people who think that Atheism is just self-evidently right and rational, and it does need to be challenged. That's a pain. Mm. It is. I mean, that's... Perfect. Thank you. I would, I would like to change the subject into, an, into another debate. How's your debate, public or private, with those Christians of the God of the gaps? Mm. I think that your approach it's really very complementary and very more useful than theirs. Have you had any debate on that matter? The answer is I have had um, some debate on that issue, particularly with some American Protestant Christians who um, take the view that the best way of com- uh, combating what they would call scientific naturalism, in other words, that reality is limited to what science can disclose, the best way of combating that is to use a God of the gaps approach. Here are things science can't explain, therefore, I I shorten the argument, there is a God. Uh, And um, I find it unpersuasive for two reasons. Number one, um, scientific advance means that what is inexplicable today may be explicable tomorrow, ten years down the line. Number two, I am not inclined to worship a god who hides in gaps. I just don't <laughs> think that's a very interesting god. And instead, I'd want to say, I, I, I want to talk about Christianity giving us this big vision of God and the world, which helps us see science as part of this, that fits it in, that helps make sense of it, that discloses its limits, but at the same time respects it, but at the same time enables us to have a bigger vision of things. And for me, that's what really matters. Now, it, it is very interesting that actually when people see this, they begin to see 
This is not about a negative reason for leaving God, it's about a positive reason. I think that's very important. I mean, if you take a statement, for example, Albert Einstein says lots of interesting things. One of them is that the, the eternal mystery of the world is its explicability. Why can we make sense of it? I mean, it's not something we need to survive. Yeah, yeah. And Einstein thinks this is really interesting. And it's that kind of question. There are big questions science is asking, like, why can we explain so much? What are the limits of our knowledge? And of course, all these unanswered questions. How do I become a good person and live a good life? And the problem is, they're very good questions, but they lie beyond the epistemic reach of science. In other words, science isn't able to answer them by the proper use of its own methods. <coughs> And therefore, either it says we, we change these to scientific questions, or we say they cannot be answered, meaning they can't be answered by scientific means. Uh, and I think that it is very, very helpful to be able to say, without losing intellectual integrity, we can begin to answer those questions. And I think that is quite important. How many of you have read a book, um, uh, basically, on, um, by Alex Rosenberg, uh, about atheism. It came out in 2011. Um, it's sort of a, um, it really is how atheism enables you to live a good life. Now, Alex Rosenberg is, in English we have this word scientism. Do you have, have the equivalent yeah. of that in Spanish? You do. He, 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 he's um, into scientism in a very big way. So he says, here are the big questions of life and I'm going to answer them scientifically. So, here we go. What is reality? It's what physics says it is. Okay? Next. Is there a God? No. Because science doesn't show God. Um, what is the meaning of life? There is none. What is the purpose of human beings? There is none. And then the final question. What's the difference between good and evil? There is no difference between good and evil. Now when I read that first, I thought I had misread it. <laughs> I thought he meant to say science is unable to tell the difference between good and evil, which is it's actually perfectly reasonable. But no, no, he was saying on the basis of science, there is no distinction between good and evil. I, I, I mean, I just thought to myself, if he is right, how? How on earth do we deal with poverty? How on earth do we deal with... Um, you know, all, all the stuff that's going on in the world at the moment. In fact, you can't be a, a thinking human being and buy into that philosophy. And that brings me to a, a very important point, which I only touch on in this book, but it is nevertheless an important point, which is we need a way of thinking that meets our needs. Do you know what I'm saying? You know, and, and that's a real concern. Uh, and I, what I very often will say in debate, Richard Dawkins, is that, you know, your system doesn't generate the answers we need to live. And he, he will say, well, that's because there are no answers, so get used to it. Uh, but my, my response is actually there are good answers. And as human beings, we need more than this. And to me, that's, that's a very important point to make. So thank you for that one. That goes back to, um, I guess, gone, the, the point one, one of you was making about... Um, talking to students, that, you know, they're at a stage in their lives where they are asking questions of me. And I think a lot of them do become cynical, saying there aren't any answers. And I think it's important to say, well, you know, actually there are answers. Maybe at this stage you aren't ready to receive them, but nevertheless they're there, and you need to know what they are, because the time may come when you need to know what they are. One, one of the questions my students, well, I, 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 I talk about lecture in genetics and one, one of the Classical questions my, my, my students ask me is how is it why they ask me why is it why is it that most of DNA doesn't code for anything and I always tell them I do not have the why answer I can tell you maybe how how this happens but why which is the the goal for that mm -hmm. I don't science does not have the answer for that so. Don't ask me, ask the philosophy. Well, I should, I mean, if I were a great teacher, I could also mix philosophy and science, but I'm not so. So I, I say, ask the philosophy teacher. I'm sure that they're very pleased with that. <laughs> I think that there may be a risk, and, and you have to distinguish both sides, not the science method and the philosophical and, or the meaning question. Uh, 
them, but uh, there may be a, a risk of uh, considering them like uh, realities uh, completely separated. You know? And uh, uh, that will lead us to a kind of uh, double truth. You know? in, in some world, uh, I believe what science say, uh, says, and then uh, I just take this as an explanation of the physical world. But for the things that matter, uh, I go to poetry, uh, religion, art, and philosophy. Now, and then uh, the, the person can be divided into this. I, I think it is very important to go to the end of your book, now, to be surprised by me and to understand that um, if you just know um, how to uh, arithmetic, arithmetic. arithmetic. Mm. You cannot uh, do the great operations of algebra, but if you know algebra, you of course know how to um, sum up, to add uh, two and three. Mm -hmm. no? And uh, so we have to go to integrate both of them, not just to say um, what do I matter, but what do I matter in this cosmos? Mm -hmm. uh, why am I important and even more important than the stars? When I see the stars, uh, and they are there for millions of years before me, you know, uh, so if we can integrate both methods in, in just uh, the question of the... I think that that is a very good point. And um, in the book I talk about this a bit, but I need to talk about more because it's very important. Um, there are three images I would use in beginning to engage your question. Maps, perspectives, levels. The maps idea I borrow from the philosopher Mary Midgley, who is a formidable, uh, or was, I'm afraid she died in November, formidable English philosopher who died at the age of 92. I remember once having a cup of tea with her. Um, and I retired from that conversation bruised. It was, it, was, it was formidable. But she says, look, reality is really complex, and therefore we need multiple working methods, multiple toolkits to be able to engage it properly. No one toolkit is good enough. And secondly, therefore we need multiple maps, multiple maps. In other words, there might be a scientific map, there might be a religious map, just like, you know, thinking about Spain, there might be a sort of physical map, then there might be a political map showing the various regions, things like that. And you put them together, and you get the full picture. Mm -hmm. And what she is saying is that each map gives part of the picture. And we need to find a way of bringing them together. And, and maybe that's where it becomes difficult, but nevertheless she's saying we have to find a way of bringing these together. Multiple perspectives is another approach which is helpful. It's saying it's like looking at a very complex building or a beautiful mountain and it looks different from different angles and yet it's the same mountain, same building, so the sum is the totality of the perspectives. Each research method gives you a different angle of approach and they're all good but they're not complete and therefore what we need to do is, is bring these together or again different levels of meaning where in effect you're answering questions at different levels. And actually, this is probably the easiest to understand, that there can be a scientific level of engagement. You know, um, you know, I'm reaching out my hand to lift this glass of wine. Why am I doing that? Well, because there are electrical impulses making my hand contract. Why am I doing this? Because this looks a very nice red wine. You see, I mean, it, it, you see that there are multiple levels to the explanation. And Richard Dawkins is very good at showing there's a scientific explanation, and there is. But there are other levels that need to be added. And so that really is one of the key themes here, that science provides very important but incomplete understanding of our world. And as human beings, we just need more than this. Thank you. I think we have to bring those things together, but not just like a juxtaposition. Yes. Uh, but in an integrated manner. That's absolutely that right. One um, drives to the other and uh, in, a, in, a, in a good order, in a reasonable order. And that's why people like you and me and <laughs> us are, are so important because each of us can talk about the way in which we achieve this integration. Now, if, if you and I were to have a conversation, we might find we do this in a different way, 
And we might find we also <coughs> arrive at a different outcome, but the process is there. And you're dealing with students, and part of what they're concerned to do is to try and do this themselves. And what they need is a role model like you, who's done this before, who can help them think these things through. And you know, they won't necessarily accept your answers, but they want to know the process you use to get at those answers. And that's why I think you know, here at Francisco Vittori, you have a really interesting role in, in showing how you have arrived at what you think because many of them were wondering, how do I do this? And certainly, I mentioned Charles Coulson. I mentioned him in this book. Um, uh, there are two Charles Coulsons. And the one I'm talking about was a professor of chemistry at Oxford. The, the one you're probably thinking of was uh, in the Nixon White House and, and got into trouble over Watergate. Um, but the one I'm thinking about, the one I'm thinking about was a very prominent Methodist lay preacher in England who was also one of Oxford's leading ke well, chemists. And he had found a way of holding together his science and his faith. And he talked about this. And one night he talked about it to me. And that was in 1973. So we're talking about, is that 46 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> I am old, sorry. Um, but um, it was a long time ago. But actually, what he gave me was like the beginnings of where I am now I am. He gave me a way of thinking that I could take and use and develop. <laughs> And, and, you know, that, that's one of the roles you guys can play. You know, here's how I do it. Maybe it could help you. You know, it doesn't need to be the final answer. It needs to be the beginnings of a process. I would like to change anything. I, I would like to know what is your opinion about what uh, should we do in our society in order to, um, um, to show children of teenagers the importance of this that we are talking here. The importance of uh, the, the, the necessity that we have to have the knowledge of scientific discoveries, but also to, uh, to make questions about the more important things or the more uh, different questions. Because now, in my opinion, the children here, the, 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 they are also the university, they are with the idea that uh, science is uh, uh, able to answer almost everything. We can create uh, artificial intelligence. We can uh, know almost everything. <coughs> nature is uh, uh, order and is founded uh, and all these type of things. And what is the, the point that we should? Uh, um, I don't know. I just to spread this to um, to start to, mm -hmm. to do anything in order to change this in the society. <coughs> we can do uh, here in universities like this one or many others, but um, it's a real problem to, uh, to make them uh, think about these important things from the earlier uh, time. I think that, that's a very good question, and let me, let me try and answer it. In England, at the moment, we are having a problem with the internet. And the problem with the internet is that... Um, it is distributing material which, first of all, motivates young people to kill themselves. You're worthless. And then second says, and here's how you can do it, and provides them with the technical knowledge they know they need to be able to kill themselves. And that, that's very disturbing. Of course, you, you, you all know about hate crimes online and things like that. But the people who devised the Internet um, didn't have this in mind at all. They, they had the idea that sharing of knowledge is a good thing, and, and so what's the problem? I think one, one of the things I think we do need to bring into this is our thinking about human nature. Because for me, one of the tragedies of human nature is that we develop some very, very good tools and use them for very bad ends. And, and very often, you know, we can develop a technique or a new form of knowledge, and it can be used to help, and it can be used to destroy and yet it's the same people who are making those decisions. And so when I think about the, the issues you've raised, artificial intelligence and so on, you know, my, my feeling is that potentially there could be some very good things here. There could also be some very bad things. And so it's all a question of how we help people to become critical, reflective, realizing that scientific advance is not just about technological convenience, it's about being able to do certain things <laughs> 
which might actually be irreversible and deeply destructive. And, and those are questions we need to raise. I remember a debate about um, the place of science in society at Cambridge University, and um, one speaker stood up and said, well, science has given us all these wonderful things, and he listed them. And the next speaker simply stood up and said, and it's also given us the atom bomb. It's also given us um, design of pathogens. You know, and, he, and he gave a long list and said, and the paradox is that you know, that science has done all these things, and we need to be very realistic about who we are, because the danger is that we've developed certain things that can be used. And it, again, it's all to do with this deep concern you find in a work which, at first sight, isn't at all theological, and that's J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. But actually, it is. Uh, and it, it, it's exploring what happens when you have technology that can be used to do things. And it, 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 it's about, in effect, how you seize power. It's very, very interesting. Um, but our, for me, I think part of the thing we need to say is that, yes, science does help us do many, many things, but it also makes certain things possible that might <clears throat> radically change and damage us. I mean, to talk about this. And we can't talk about it without talking about who we are and why we've gone wrong in the past, and why that might happen again. And so I find that a very uncomfortable conversation to have with people, but I find that once you get the conversation underway, it makes people realise that it's a bit more complicated than just, now we can do this because of science. It's actually, because we can do this, there are new risks. We've got to think about things, and very often one of the issues that very often keep coming back to is, do we need a new morality, a new way of thinking about things to cope with these new situations because they move us up a level and we're not ready for this yet and because we're not ready for this we don't do anything so it happens and we're stuck with it. So I, I think that, that's how I would suggest you begin to broach these issues but I think they are very important and I think that there's a need not to say these things mustn't happen but rather let's keep our eyes open as we think about how best to deal with these developments. fueron enanos en cuestiones, justamente esta palabra enanos, en cuestiones de naturaleza humana y ética, no reprochándoles su enanismo, sino la incapacidad de una cierta cultura de hacer avanzar ambos ámbitos del saber humano, sea el científico tecnológico, sea el humano ético, con una conformidad de manera que hemos llegado al resultado de un gigantismo científico y un enanismo ético. No sé si conoce la obra y el autor, y por ese caso es una, es una, una comparación afortunada para mostrar este desigual desarrollo en una comprensión de la naturaleza científicamente de medida y una comprensión, por el contrario, del hombre, de su naturaleza y su obrar en la que verdaderamente la cultura moderna está aquejada de este enanismo. I think that, that is a very good point. Um, I talked about Albert Einstein a few minutes ago, and I think I'll come back to him because he, he's a very good example, a rare example of a, you know, an absolutely outstanding science who was very, very alert to broader issues. And um, as I was saying to you <coughs> earlier, I mean, Einstein was absolutely convinced that science could not deal with issues of morality, 
and was really concerned that science was making certain moral possibilities real, but they weren't necessarily good. Now, the, the classic example is this. You think of Einstein's paper of 1905, in which he demonstrated the equivalence of mass and energy. And you work out where that might go if you were somehow able to convert mass into energy. And then in 1938, you learn that in Germany, um, the fission of uranium nuclei has happened. And the realization this could initiate a chain reaction and therefore lead to an atomic bomb. And as you probably know, Einstein wrote to President Roosevelt saying, <laughs> you've got to think about this because something is going to happen which could be utterly disastrous for the world unless you do something. You know, this, this is going to be disastrous. And of course, that, that initiated the atomic bomb program in America, which Einstein never took part in because he was politically questionable. But Einstein, you know, in justifying that decision said, I was confronted with a moral decision. And the moral decision was whether Nazism would, in effect, become invulnerable, or whether somebody would, in effect, stop it, and perhaps limit the use of these new weapons, which was now inevitable due to scientific progress. And, and you can see him, and he, he agonized over this, because you know, he, he could see this was not going to go well, whatever happened but that one of these options was better than the other. And I, I would say that he was a very good scientist who was morally realistic about human nature and just felt something had to be done. But I, th I think I, I know what, your, um, you, what, what your, your colleague is thinking about scientific giants, yes, but not so good at the moral level. And I think that, that, is, that is realistic. I mean, I mean, we do occasionally find people who are outstanding at every level. But sometimes there's a sort of professional focalization, which means you are very, very good at this and not quite so good at this. And, and Einstein is a relatively rare example of, of an absolutely brilliant scientist who really was a good human being at most levels, although not at all levels. <laughs> because you may have read about the discovery of his travel di diaries in um, Asia in the 1920s, where he makes some very unfortunate racist comments about um, Asians, which uh, everyone knows about. And actually, the, the feeling is, well, maybe that's culturally understandable, but he shouldn't have said that. You, know. you have to say that, <clears throat> that the things that matter uh, are things that can be proven. Mm. And, and uh, in a way, uh, our society has, has built our, uh, the, the, the educational system stressing the, the science. And uh, there is no, no places for this uh, to, to think properly in this, in this way, in this, in this matter, particularly in, 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 well, in many professions, but I am thinking in my own profession that this, uh, this is medicine. And, uh, I would like to know to know your opinion about the future. Are you optimistic or or not, respecting how we are going on, and why? Well, I, I'm not optimistic, <coughs> um, but the, I may have a misunderstanding of the situation. So maybe my um, concerns here are, are, are unrealistic. But why I think I see happening is that um, it's very much like what um, Jonathan Haidt the American psychologist says in some of his books, um, which is that actually very often we present the rational justification of a belief as actually an ad hoc, post hoc justification of something we want to be true for other reasons. In other words, it, it, it's almost like um, here is the way we would like the world to be. We will now argue that it is like this. Here is what we would like ourselves to be we will now argue that this is actually what we are like. In other words, I'm really concerned about almost like a post-truth generation, where the way I see things is the way things are. 
And I see that in a lot of my students, I'm afraid, that there's this feeling that um, I can construct my own personal reality and sustain it by being very selective about my friends, being very selective about the websites I visit and so on, where in effect you almost inhabit a bubble um, rather than the broader context. And so um, one of my concerns is that we're seeing social fragmentation which means that people who would normally talk to each other and argue with each other and actually help them to see two sides of an argument don't talk to each other anymore. And that's one of the things that I noticed in debating with the new atheists, that it was almost as if it was a collision of two different universes, you know, where in effect there was no engagement. It was very much, here's one way of thinking, here's another way of thinking, let's have a sort of confrontation but it doesn't change anything, and then you, you move ahead apart from that. <coughs> so I, I, I do worry about that. Um, I, maybe I'm being silly, um, but the, the real thing worries me is that if this is true, I'm not quite sure what we can do about it, because people are beginning to form, if you like, I used the word bubbles, I'm sure there's a better word to use, but it's basically um, groups of people who reinforce each other's beliefs who stigmatize or demonize those who are outside the groups and hence prevent dialogue because di dialogue is about contamination. It's about taint. You know, it's, it's a very negative thing. Whereas for me, you, know, you talk to people you disagree with because, first of all, it's a reality check. And secondly, it means when I argue, I can argue because I think I've understood this person, I've got them right. So I, I'm not very positive, but this may be a personal judgment, which is not, not, not reliable. So I have to be very honest about this. <laughs> well, I think internet helps to reinforce all of, all of this because all these algorithms. They when I when I get into Spotify and I listen to teenage fan club or a pop group, immediately they bring for us teenage fan club mm -hmm. uh, bands or like, uh, mm -hmm. like bands that they sound the same. Mm -hmm. So if I just uh, take my decisions um, base, basing them on what uh, this algorithm says, mm -hmm. I will always hear, listen to the same kind of music. I will mm -hmm. never listen to Bossa Nova, never. Because Spotify, <laughs> no, I mean, because Spotify is always saying, the the, mm -hmm. uh, giving, to be the same information, so this is something that I think uh, reinforces what maybe is happening with uh, young people. Mm -hmm. La última y terminamos, Leopoldo. Decía mía, no, no. Leopoldo es el autor de este libro. Y una última cuestión, esta es, eh, eran dos en realidad, eh, Richard Swinburne, Richard Swinburne. In the existence of God, the existence of God. Eh, tiene un planteamiento que me parece sumamente interesante, es un, es un filósofo de la religión, de matriz analítica, y afirma que en relación a las cuestiones cosmológicas y científicas en general, la cuestión de su inicio, de su principio, es resuelta con la hipótesis Dios del modo más simple, más fuerte, más elegante y sobre todo más económico. Esta es la hipótesis más económica para explicar cuestiones relativas a los fundamentos de la ciencia y no se trata de cuestiones teológicas ni de cuestiones científicas. No sé si supongo que conocerá al autor. 
Thank you. Um, lots of very interesting points there. On the final point you made, Richard Swinburne is very interesting. And um, I think that the, the points that he makes, which you described very well, are important. And I know that Richard Dawkins has been asked, you know, if there was one thing that might make you rethink your atheism, what might it be? And his answer is, why did the universe come into being with certain fundamental um, values for constants of nature which allowed life to emerge? And that actually is really what Richard Swinburne is saying. You've got to explain that simply. And the best explanation is God. And I think that's an important point, because Dawkins makes a virtue out of not having read any works of theology. Why should I? <laughs> they're, they're, they're useless. Um, you know, and... Um, the result is that, that the theologians you know, will just say, look, he does not know what he's talking about. And actually, that point has been heard. People are realizing that Dawkins really has limited access to the ideas of his opponents. Some people are beginning to realize that they may be um, committing themselves to someone who doesn't really quite understand the positions he's criticizing. But I think there's another point here which is really interesting, and it's this. Why is Richard Dawkins so influential? Because when you think about it, he wrote um, the book, The Selfish Gene, which made him very, very famous in 1976. And really, um, he's hardly done any scientific research since then. And, and so we have this paradox that Dawkins is presented almost as a genius scientist. But his fellow scientists would say, <laughs> he is not one of us. He's, he is kind of a popularizer and an ideologue. That's your point, and that's a very good point. And so it, it raises a very interesting question, which is, is the influence of Richard Dawkins really because he's a celebrity? Because in Britain, celebrity culture is very big. When a celebrity says something, you go, oh, you know, well, I don't, but I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> other people do. And I think that, that that is really interesting. Here's what I think. I think... Um, Richard Dawkins is saying what a lot of people would like to be true. And so they're able to point to Richard Dawkins and says, he gives intellectual legitimacy to what I think. And I, I think that's very interesting. So I remember once um, going to a bookshop in Oxford and um, talking to the bookshop manager. He said, oh, we had a, a launch last night for Richard, on Richard Dawkins' books. It was really interesting. People bought this book, I think it was The God Delusion, and they came up clutching it to themselves, <laughs> almost as if this was some sort of religious artifact or some, something which would protect them. He said, it's very, very strange. It's almost as if this was guaranteeing <coughs> security or something. He said, it's very, very strange. It's almost as if they worshipped him. And that's what I think. I think the new atheism is a form of religion. Uh, basically, you have um, a prophet, Richard Dawkins, and interestingly, listen to this, because people are so dependent on what he thinks, he has to be infallible. And therefore, there's this intense desire to protect him from his critics, like me. Because if he's wrong on one thing, then maybe the whole thing unravels. So it's really very interesting. Thank you for that great question. Mm -hmm. La última pregunta, y terminamos. ¿Alguien se quiere animar? My question is actually quite That's different. I mean, and, and I apologize for changing this. No, no, go ahead. In a rude way, but uh, I like to know your point or your opinion. Um, but what's the contribution, if any, of the event uh, Jesus Christ in all this debate mm -hmm. about human nature, about transcendence, about uh, eventually meaning? I mean, God made, made flesh uh, comes with any kind of uh, contribution to mm. this whole debate we are having to now? I think that's a really interesting question. And I do touch on this in the book, but I'm happy to say more tonight. <laughs> um, one of the reasons I was an atheist when I was a younger person is this. Um, you know, I didn't, really, I didn't believe there was a God, but supposing there was one, well, God was up there, and I'm down here in space and time. And that means God is outside the space I inhabit and therefore has no relevance to me whatsoever. And that, that for me was a very important role motivation for being an atheist. You know, God was 
irrelevant. Um, and then exploring this rich territory of Christianity, um, I'm beginning to realize this idea of incarnation. If it's right, it's saying God chose to enter into my place of habitation because I and you and everyone matters to him. And that actually made, made it very, very different. So that, that actually was, was quite important for me because it, in effect, was um, moving me away from my very stereotyped view of God as a kind of absent first principle, if I put it like that. But I think more generally, um, it, there's a really interesting question here, which is that uh, I talked a bit about the importance of moral values. I didn't really develop that point. But you know, with moral values, it's one thing to say, be good. You need to be shown what to be good looks like. You need to point and say, look, there is someone who is behaving in a good way. And for me, that, that's one of the reasons why Christ is so important. Because he shows me what good, at least in the Christian sense of the word, might be. And therefore it helps me work out how, when I try to be good, that is a role model for me. So it, it, it's actually, it is quite important. Now, I don't talk all that much about this here because it didn't seem all that relevant to the argument of the book. But it is an important issue, as you rightly suggest. And so for me, the, the idea of the incarnation is almost, um, almost like um, the focal point of so much because if someone were to say to me, what is God like? Well, I'm going to say in the end, it, the best visual image we have of God is actually Jesus Christ. And that means we're talking about a person, not an abstract principle or power, uh, and, and someone to whom we can relate uh, and journey with. Uh, and, and to me, that's really very important. I need to say a lot more, but the, the short answer to a very good question is, it matters a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Salvador, please. <laughs> In a way, it's related to this, but in an indirect way. Uh, in, sometimes in the conversation, you have uh, spoken about human nature. Mm. And I think and, and, and the book is in a, mainly, and, and your, your uh, exposition here was mainly about uh, God. No? But I think that human nature could be um, a field uh, where uh, science and uh, philosophy and theology can. can uh, um, and meet themselves, not, uh, and not in a um, small manner, but in a, in a, in a very important issue. You know, um, in philosophy, um, now it's a uh, uh, opinion discussion, uh, um, debated question. Mm. Uh, the existence of human of a human nature, but I think that in science, in the scientific. Uh, uh, way of, of, of speaking, we can say some things of, uh, about this human nature. So uh, maybe that could be um, a way to recover this uh, conception of uh, this philosophical and theological conception, because I think that the meaning is uh, mainly the meaning of that human being. I think that is very important. Um, I touch on this a little bit in chapter 11 on history, culture, and faith, but not enough. You're quite right. Um, I think one of the things I want to say is that within the natural sciences, you have methodological diversity. And this means that when, you, when we're talking about the scientific investigation of, well, let, let's say human beings, to come back to human nature, okay? But then, in effect, you have different accounts from a physiological, from a biochemical, from a biophysical point of view. And the difficulty is that this is very, very helpful because it enables us to understand how we function, and hence when we malfunction, you can do something about it. But there is this bigger question about, well, these are all part of a bigger picture. What is the bigger picture? 
And what can we learn from this? Why, do, why if we're so clever, do we do so many stupid things? I mean, uh, I, I, mean uh, you know, I, I watch American politics occasionally. I'm, I'm puzzled by it. <laughs> and, you know, uh, how, how do we make sense of this? And I think you're right. that We do need to say that, um, <coughs> that um, we can look at humanity from different aspects or different levels, but in the end, we deal with each other as totalities. And we're complicated. And that, that means that in order to deal with each other, we need to have this bigger picture. And of course, that, that's even before we begin to think about deeper spiritual and theological questions. I think that the real difficulty is that, um, I talk to lots of scientists about this, and they are very good at giving me their angle on this, which is disciplinary specific. And then you say, well, how does that fit into a bigger picture? They'll say, well, I, I, I mean, you know, I'm not really sure, but I can tell you about my, my, you know, my discipline. You know? And I think that this probably means that somebody who is a synthesizer has to stand back and try and weave all these things together. Now, you may have read E.O. Wilson's book, Consilience, which came out in 1999. I don't think it's a very good book because he relies too much on the Enlightenment and, in effect, gives privilege to natural sciences. But what he is saying is that we need synthesizers. What he means by that is people who can bring together multiple perspectives and see the big picture. And he has a wonderful, um, a wonderful line in that book. We are inundated with information, but we are starved of meaning. Inundated by information, starved of meaning. In other words, we've got all this information, but somebody needs to put it all together and say, this is what means. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm really suggesting is that actually we do need people who can think about this. And this may well be that there's somebody who, located in one scientific discipline, can kind of bring them together. Or it might mean that we're looking to theologians or philosophers of religion to do this for us. But it certainly means that um, the real problem is that Scientific specialization leads to fragmentation of knowledge. And actually, you know, the Renaissance, which is now well in the past, tried to respond to the growth of knowledge by holding things together. And interestingly, in Victorian England during the 19th century, the phrase, a Renaissance man, was actually used to mean somebody specifically who was able to resist this fragmentation and hold things together. Now, I think we probably need to do that all over again today. Uh, but it, it's harder now than it was in the 19th century, I think, but it still needs to be done. Yeah. Muchas gracias a todos. Esperemos que hayáis disfrutado tanto como yo, por lo menos, con esta presentación y que habéis disfrutado del libro y, bueno, Dar las gracias a todos. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonardo.